Palantir stock has been trending in popularity as of late, and a lot of people are wondering if they should buy more, sell what they have, or stand on the side and wait for a better timing. As the market is still very volatile at the moment, we should be careful about which positions to pick and what would be the exposure and their timing. Over the past few days, the price action of Palantir has brought the stock to a high of $8.58 before stabilizing around $7.96. Palantir has been having an interesting past few days. Despite the market conditions being challenging and the sell-off pressure remaining high, the stock price of the company has been able to hold the ground around $8, which is a good news for those who have been holding the stock for some time. The main reason for Palantir's sell-off has been the doubts cast over the company's business model the fear that it may rely too much on the public sector contracts, and the market sentiment about speculative stocks in general. At this time, I believe that dollar average cost may be the strategy to go for the short and medium term, and the salvation of Palantir's stock price will happen along with other stocks that people put in the same category, sometimes with some mental shortcuts that are not theoretically accurate, but definitely fitting with the impression investors have ever since the day that the company went public. The question now is if Palantir has a bright long-term future ahead of it, and personally, I think it does. That has been the reason why I decided to hold on my position and to give the company more time to develop its full potentials. Another key aspect to grasp if you're trading Palantir is to make sure that you give yourself enough time to gradually build up a position and to be able to hold it for at least 12 to 24 months. At the current stage, the long-term perspectives are more important to determine if you want to enter the stock than the short-term price fluctuations. Now, let's also take a look at the technicals of the stock. The trading volume of Palantir has recently been 40 million shares, compared to an average volume of 54 million shares. Over the previous 52-week period, its price fluctuated between $6.44 and $29.30. The market cap of Palantir is currently at $16 billion versus the enterprise value of $26 billion. The difference between the market cap and the enterprise value is the premium or discount the financial market is willing to allocate to the company based on its current fundamentals, leverage, and asset composition. The enterprise value is the combined value of the company's assets minus the debts. If the company has a lot of debts or a negative image amongst market participants, the asset's value may be impaired. With that being said, at the end of the day, it remains an estimation of the market every time it publishes its financial statements, so it's less reactive than the market cap and often more lenient for many companies. One key element to note about the enterprise value is that for many growth-type companies, one of the most significant assets they own is the goodwill. Goodwill is an expectation of the market that a company can generate more profit or to have more growth than another company, partially because it has a good management, a stronger brand recognition, and a bigger online following. It is basically what is unique about this company in particular compared to an alternative competitor. In other words, it's not a tangible asset that companies can use. However, it is often the reason why some companies are perceived to be trading at a discount, because the market cap is lower than the enterprise value, and it's also less reactive than the market cap in volatile situations. If the company goes to liquidation, any intangible would be likely gone. The good world would be evaporated, and we would be left sharing whatever that's left on the balance sheet. When we compare the current price to the historical price fluctuations, the stock is 25% higher than its one-month low, 25% higher than its 12-week low, and 25% higher than the 52-week low. On the options market, which gives us a hint on the market sentiment about where the stock price is likely going to go next, the implied volatility is 75% versus a historical volatility of 103%. The put call volume ratio is currently 0.6. It is normal for many stocks to tend to have a higher put option volume than what they deserve because many institutional investors hedge their long positions by buying put options. The most recent volume of options traded 
has been 25,000 contracts a day versus the 30-day average of 79,000. In terms of open interest, the most recent volume of open interest has been 3.1 million contracts versus the 30-day average of 3.5 million contracts. In terms of its shareholder structure, institutional shareholders own 33% of the outstanding shares. The biggest shareholders include Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street. It's relevant to understand the shareholder composition of a company because this helps to determine whether you should hold the stock long term or to view it as a trade opportunity. If the stock is mainly held by retail traders, this may be a sign that the stock lacks the depth to justify long-term trust from shareholders. Typically, the consensus is that there should be at least 25 to 30% of institutional participation for the stock to be perceived as a sound investment and not just a short-term trade. This is obviously subject to a lot of exceptions since there are many great companies, mostly held by retail investors as well, but that tends to be the exception and not the rule. Let's also take a look at the short interest present in the stock, which is the amount of positions aiming to profit if the share price falls lower. Sometimes when there are significant short interest in the total volume, this can be a sign that there is an organized shorting operation occurring. The current short interest is 6.4% of the total float and 51% of the transactions are coming out of the dark pools. Usually, if the short interest is above 15% of the total volume and a significant portion of the short volume coming out of the dark pools, it may suggest that there are institutional positions taken to short the stock and that there would be potentials for a short squeeze. I would recommend to buy Palantir stock now and to leave enough space to gradually increase your positions over the next six months and to psychologically prepare for additional retracements that your portfolio should go through. I would recommend to commit between 3-5% to of your portfolio's capital and also recommend to split the allocation in batches of 20% at a time so that you can purchase more if it retraces. Now, given the current market environment, I believe that the equity market is in a vast phase of correction, especially when it comes to tech and growth type equities. The financial market has been living and breathing thanks to the continuous creation of new capital with different waves of quantitative easings, which will have consequences on the price of assets as well as their yields. With the interest rates kept relatively low over the years and the increase of amount of capital in circulation, this will keep putting significant pressure on the profit that we can expect the investment products across the board. And this, by the way, is a reality that may shift in the years to come if the interest rate of core infrastructures within our globally financialized system increases. It's useful to remember that the market doesn't represent the real economy, and of course, the real economy doesn't always reflect in the stock performance, since the name of the game here is ultimately called supply and demand, which depends on a whole bunch of factors that go way beyond our own control. If we think about it, this is like saying, if your neighborhood house that is put up for sale is only allowing those who actually want to live inside to buy it, Versus if you allow every single type of buyer with different intent or reasons to buy or to sell it. So obviously, there will be a significant difference in the price of this asset for those two scenarios. The market currently works more like the second option. And assuming that it would only reflect the fundamentals of the underlying economy would correspond to the first option. There are a few elements that are considered to be the reasons. The first one is the significant increase of amount of money printed by the central banks around the world, which is then distributed to the banks with the expectation that they will be loaned to businesses. Normally, that's a good thing, but with a lack of opportunities in the real economy, the significant portion of that money actually went back to the financial system to buy up the price of existing assets. Now that the QEs have been wrapping up, or ended around the world, I think that this drive behind asset price may no longer be as relevant as it is right now for the future. It is now compensated by the arrival of capital from one region to another, and from one sector to another even within the same jurisdiction. With the increase of tensions around the world, 
capital is always looking for a safe haven to park their money into. Not just for a place to grow the nominal value, but with a currency that tends to keep its purchasing power as well. The third factor is the creation or the birth of artificial bubbles either maintained by the market trends built up over the years or out of necessity. Capital needs to find a place to stay. Some good examples of this would include the EV sector in the 2020 and the oil and gas securities when there are tensions around the world. Either way, when it comes to the price trends of the market, degree of uncertainty is a key drive behind the price fluctuations and that is likely going to increase as we go on from there. When companies announce that they are going to enter or exit different markets or that they will be trading on different platforms and exchanges, this can all have significant ramifications on the price of this asset. Some of the considerations to have when operating in this context include having a clear view of what is going on, especially regarding the cash flow and the capital flow, and avoid certain potential pitfalls. One of these is to be careful with short positions. Inherently, short positions are riskier than long positions as the downside of long positions is limited, whereas the short positions can lose you as much money as the stock price may reach, which is infinite. On top of that, we're now seeing a new phenomenon with short squeezes involving a group of retail traders propping the stock price up, forcing short sellers to recover their positions. Sometimes the attempt will not succeed, but sometimes they end up in very spectacular success. Something else to consider is to treat tech stocks with care. To start ask questions when the price of a security skyrockets without real fundamentals, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be touching it with a 10-foot pole, but it does mean that there should be a difference between the decision of long-term holding and short-term trading. Either way, a rule of thumb is that each position should be structured in a way so that their individual performances will never affect the portfolio's stability. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.